Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Carlo, and I'm an alcoholic. I could just imagine the whispering. I know what would go on in my head when they'd say, it costs us $700 to $1,000 to bring in a speaker. I'd be thinking, this better be good. (laughs) No pressure at all. Uh, Well, I may be cleaning some houses after this is over. Pay that back. Uh, First, I want to thank you for having me. I want to thank Pixie. And, uh, and the group for having me out here, uh, this month and, uh, and Mark for picking us up from the airport. What a, what a great day we had. You know, just, uh, just getting to, I mean, they say AA is the only place you can go and meet somebody new and reminisce. You know, you just, uh, <laughs> meet somebody you didn't know before and reminisce and, and, uh, he took us to a nice breakfast and then, uh, um, I'm a massage therapist, so we did a little research. He even knew where to take. He took me to uh, took us to this great store, and we started talking about lavender. And before we knew it, we were talking about God, you know. And um, you know, it's just like um, it, we just dig deep, you know. None of us are real small talkers, but uh, so it got it got really good. And I want to thank you, Mark, and thank our friend Beth for coming out, and thank my husband for coming up and uh, and hanging with me this weekend. Uh, um, it's it's kind of nice to have that. You guys had him here last month, and and uh, you know he's a lot of fun, isn't he? He's yeah, you know sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah. That's, uh, sometimes right before a conference or something where we're both going, uh, uh, we'll have had a heated discussion, and we get there, and then he'll give his talk, and people come up to me, and I'm still a little bit smarting from the afternoon, and they'll go, wow, is he always that funny? You must be, you must be just rolling in laughter all the time. And I'm like, no, he's not. He's, (laughs) no. (laughs) Well, we have a good time, and we get to do this a lot together, like I said. And uh, I don't know, a year or so ago, we were out on the East Coast, and we were walking the boardwalk, just hanging out between, between meetings at the conference, and and uh, just uh, walking up and down the, looking at the ocean, and he used to ride motorcycles, so he all of a sudden spotted this kiosk of, from the Lions Club who was raffling off on, uh, Harley Davidson, fully dressed Harley Davidson, you know, and so for him, it's like, whoop, he heads straight over there, and he says, it only takes one ticket to win, honey, and uh, and I thought, yeah, honey, you just go over there, you win that Harley, and we'll sell it and fix the kitchen, right? Um, but... Uh, <laughs> So he's on his way over there, and I'm not that interested in that, so um, I'm scrolling. and But I can hear what he's saying, and he's filling out the ticket so that uh, he can win. And um, and the guys noticed where he was from. He said, God, you're a long way from home. You're in L.A. We were in Maryland. And he, and he said, yeah, uh, what are you doing way out here? Well, we're, we're at an AA convention. AA, American Airlines? What do you do at a... <laughs> He said, no, Alcoholics Anonymous. And they said, well, what do you do at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting? And he said, well, we share our experience, strength, and hope. You know, we talk about what we were like, what happened, and what we're like today, how our lives have changed. For example, my wife, she used to be a prostitute. (laughs) And I've met him before, so it didn't surprise me that much, but I... My ears did perk up, and and so he goes on to say, he says, but it's all okay now, because now she's going to be a massage therapist. (laughs) Oh, oh, break out the Virginia Slims, honey. We've come a long, long way. (laughs) My sobriety date September 25th, 1987, and I hope I never, ever, ever, ever have to change that date. Everything that I do every single day is based on not having to change that date. And that doesn't mean that I've, for 28 years, have been running away from a drink. I have not. I've not been backing up going, no, 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 no booze, no booze, no booze. You guys gave me something else to do. You gave me a sufficient substitute. You gave me something that over time turned out to be better than the life I was living drinking. 
and and it had to be it must be good because I've been here for 28 years and before AA I never did anything on purpose for 28 years that was of any value I had to come here to have a life and with alcohol at the very end especially I was just scraping along and alcohol was trouble for me almost from the very beginning but there was something in there that just did it for me you know the effect that alcohol produced in me was just it was worth it you know what I mean it was worth it the best description of alcoholism I ever uh, still to this day believe exists is on page 44 in our big book and it says if when you honestly want to find you cannot quit entirely or if when drinking have little control over the amount you take you're probably alcoholic if that be the case you may be suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience will conquer. If that's you, boom, welcome. Doesn't mean, doesn't matter who your daddy was, where you were born, if you were rich, if you were poor. There are some of us alcoholics who'll never outdrink our money, ever. You know, some of us came in having built and lost great empires. Some of us came in uh, later in life, you know. Me, I peaked out at about 11 and a half. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but didn't get here till I was 29. So I don't know exactly why I'm an alcoholic. I used to think it was very important to try to figure that out. Was it my crazy, dark, dramatic, violent, perverted family? You know, if you had my family, you'd drink too. You know, but I sit right next to my husband in AA meetings, and he comes from a family that just loved each other. I mean, they were that, that family, you know, the family. Ugh. You know, his dad painted the family truck, the colors of his high school, that kind, that family, yeah. <laughs> I get a little he sugar headache when I think of sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, same thing happens to him when he picks up a drink that happens to me. He can't control the amount he's going to take, and then when he puts it down for any amount of time, he can't stay away. You know, that allergy kicks in when I'm drinking, and when I'm not drinking, the obsession kicks in. So I, we all get to that point of somehow, some way, that horrible condition of alcoholism where we are either drinking or thinking about drinking, drinking or thinking about drinking, drinking or thinking about drinking all the time. And if that's you and you're new to this, welcome. Welcome. I hope that you'll grab one of the flimsy reeds handed to you. One of my favorite lines in the book is what seemed to be a flimsy reed turned out to be the loving and powerful hand of God. Anything, anything we hand you, those three, those three uh, uh, people that stood up here and read, maybe against their nerves, you know, maybe against their better judgment, got up here and read anyway, you know, as fearful as that is. But a flimsy reed, you get up here, and every time I say yes to something you guys ask me to do, it pulls me into the room just a little bit more, and it still works 28 years later you know will you read will you lead will you speak will you sponsor me will you go give that guy a ride would you get a cup of coffee will you read the big book all of those things those flimsy reads they turn out to be powerful powerful things and they have for me and I'm, I'm just so glad to be here so so it wasn't my family um, uh, and uh, I my mother was a single mother of, of two girls and uh, uh, we moved around a lot for the rent, and I was so I was always going to a new school. And I don't believe alcoholism is in the self-esteem; it is in, not in my neuroses. None of none of those things. I mean, alcoholics. A lot of us are neurotic, but not every neurotic is an alcoholic, you know. And um, I, I really, really, all these years later, I just come right back to everything that I do is about staying separated from that first drink. That's the first drink that gets me, and that only happens to 10% to of the population. You know, it just doesn't happen to everybody. So that's what we're doing here. There's only one small requirement to be in this room, one small, one tiny little requirement. You can be an addict. You can be an overeater. You can be all those things. But our common problem, our common solution here comes under the lash of alcoholism. And if you have that, you are welcome. Um, Anyway, we moved around a lot for the rent, and I was a kind of a social kid, so whatever it was we were doing at the new school, I wanted to do that too. If we were playing softball, I wanted to do that. If we were running track, let's do that. We're doing academics, I want to know all the answers, you know, and, and, uh, uh, I just, uh, I've got a little bit of a competitive bone, so I began to, uh, want to be the first woman president of the United States. You know, I wanted to be the first woman to run a four minute mile. First woman Major League Baseball player, you know, like that. And by the time sixth grade was over, I was tired and I needed a drink. You know what I mean? I just...
<laughs> the deal was, though, when I drank it, it worked. And again, that reaction, that, that physical, chemical reaction does not happen to everybody. It happens to me. And I still get baffled by that. You know, sometimes I'll go out and I'll see a non-alcoholic take a drink. <sighs> It, it, I mean, it's, it's really, it's really amazing to me, you know, that they don't even care. They don't even care that the drink is sitting there. They don't care that the ice is melting in there and watering it down. They don't care that the straw is crawling up over the side of the glass. They may not even have a, they might have a sip and then just leave it. And I don't get that. I just don't get it. Their primary purpose to go into a bar is to dance. What? So... I got my first social resentment behind a game of spin the bottle, and I know they don't even play that game these days. They just get right down to business, don't they? <laughs> but we played it back then, and it was that summer going up into seventh grade, you know, between sixth and seventh grade, and we were at my friend's house, and we were playing spin the bottle, a few boys, a few girls. And, you know, by that time, too, I had, uh, I don't know if this happens to you, but we come to conclusions erroneous conclusions, but they're my conclusions, and so I think they're true. You know, in other words, in the, in the words of my friend Beth, um, she make, uh, I make stuff up, is what she says. And, um, and I had all these ideas about sex, basically. You know, I'd had a lot of babysitters, a lot of uh, family member, uh, a family member who, uh, you know, would, there was a lot of inappropriate stuff going on in my house. And, and when I was new to AA, I thought that maybe that had something to do with my alcoholism, too, which it turned out not everybody who was molested becomes an alcoholic either. It just doesn't do it for them. You know, if it did, maybe they would. But... But, but I, nevertheless, I had these ideas about sex. And, you know, when we come to AA, we, these are the things that we have to examine and start to let go. But I didn't know that back then. And so I, I, it was also the middle of the 60s. So I had all these ideas about free love and stuff. I'm 12, you know, <laughs> or 11. And, uh, and so I think, oh, let's go for it, you know. And anyway, the bottle we were spinning landed on me, and I went off into the bedroom with one of the boys. And we'd been passing around a bottle of my friend's dad's whiskey and, and so I'm in the in the other room with one of the boys, and we're both doing the same thing as far as I can tell. But when we came back out of that bedroom, they called him a player and me a slut. And I did not think that was fair. I still don't think it's fair if you want to know the truth. But every sponsor I've ever had has told me the fair comes around once a year and it lasts two weeks. That's all you get for fair. <laughs> so, you know, and I was just one of those, I, again, my ideas against the world's ideas, and when they don't match, you know, I fight. I fought for a while, and, and I got a reputation I didn't understand, nor could I take responsibility for. Didn't understand those unwritten rules like good girls do and say they don't or don't and say they do or something like that. I still don't think I have it right, but I don't care anymore. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, I, fought, uh, I got a bad reputation in school, and, and uh, I fought for a while to, to, uh, to stay in the game, and then I just started to let go. And I started spending more time in the girls' room than I did in the classroom and hanging out with the other girls who were letting go of their lives, too, when we'd bring stuff from our mother's medicine cabinets and from their liquor cabinets and hang out until after a while I began. Now, I'm a self-propeller. You know, I take my life into my own hands, and I began to... Uh, to take the very next step, which was to leave home. I just started to leave home. My favorite place to be back then was on my way to somewhere else. I don't know if you can relate, but that, you know. And for me, there was just peace in that. It felt like transition. You know, if I was in the car going somewhere, I didn't even care where, and I never thought about what I was going to do when I got there. But if I was on my way, I felt like I was in the solution somehow. And it felt like the bottle in the glove compartment, really, for me. Like, I didn't even have to have that bottle open to already feel better, you know, just knowing that thing is there. I, and that's how running away felt for me. And, or running too. I'm still not sure it wasn't the right thing to do, but I, but I went. And, um, consequently, because I was so young, I started ending up in some of the Southern California hot spots like Indio Jail and Riverside Juvenile Hall and LA Central and like that. And we did that whole dance for a while. And they'd send me home to mom and home to dad. And, and, uh, you know, just, it, just starting off in a bad way. And, when I was 14, I found myself in a place called North Beach in the San Francisco area. A girlfriend of mine and I had left home one more time and, and got out there under the open. Oh, God, I just love the way it felt on the on-ramps of the 10 freeway going east and the 101 coming north out under the open sky, just feeling free for a minute, you know. And we got one long ride all the way up into San Francisco, and the guy dropped us off into the middle of this party town. You know, to my left was Carol Dota's flashing boobs and, uh, and uh, the Condor Club, and to my right were hookers and dealers and pimps. Oh, my. And it just, uh, 
bright lights, big city. And we were on that street for 10 minutes before a couple of guys approached us, offered us money for sex, and we said yes and did the next indicated thing, and boom, a whole new career path opened up for us. And I started living a day at a time, and we have not had to live in a very, very long time. And Dr. Silkworth talks about in the chapter of the doctor's opinion that, that after a while we can't differentiate the true from the false, that after a while our alcoholic lives seem the only normal one. And I didn't realize it then, but every good thing about myself, any sign of self-respect or God-given potential or gifts or, or um, anything else that I'd had, I'd begun to trade away for the effect that alcohol produced. And if you had asked me back then, I would have told you I'd done it willingly, that this is the way it was supposed to be. A year later, I was being admitted to a mental hospital, and I was 15 years old, and by that time, everything about myself, everything I'd, any hopes, any dreams I'd had, any, um, any faith, any, any real uh, concrete beliefs that I'd had, they were shattered. They were just shattered, and I was lost. I was supposed to be in that hospital for two weeks, and I ended up being there for a year. I just sort of made myself at home and moved in. Um, it was a mental hospital, not a treatment center. They didn't have a lot of treatment centers back then. So um, a lot of my roommates had some real illnesses, real schizophrenia, real manic depression. And, um, you know, untreated, when I've got no booze or steps or fellowship or God in my understanding, it takes a little time to sort that out. And they weren't talking to me about alcoholism. They were talking to me about those disorders. And... So they were giving me daily nutritional supplements, a Thorazine, Melaril, Valium, Dalmain sleepers. I suppose they were concerned I wouldn't sleep. And if you don't, don't want to go crazy in the nut house, you got to get busy. And one of my favorite ways to be busy, I've already told you, was boys. I loved all the boys, but my favorites were those sexy smoldering types, you know. You know the kind. They just sit back there and simmer. You know what I mean? You <laughs> just never really knew when they were going to blow, you know what I mean? And, I know we got some of those guys in here tonight because I see the smoke curling up from the corners. You can't fool me. <laughs> Used to find them so exciting. Now today I know that feeling is fear, <laughs> so I stay away. <laughs> but the trouble with guys like that in the nut house is that they're usually there trying to hide from a junior prison sentence. They don't want to go to California Youth Authority, so they're trying to hide and lay low, you know, just do the program and then maybe they'll get out. But uh, but they can't, you know, they're, they get beside themselves. Like my first boyfriend, he ended up blowing up, and he threw a chair through the big plate glass window of the boys' unit. And my next boyfriend, he blew up, and he uh, threw a nurse through the big plate glass window of the boys' unit. So that was progressive, too. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've always thought I should have a soundtrack to my life. You know, music playing in the background of all this drama going on, right? You know, just... Like one day, maybe Bob Dylan following you around, strumming a ballad, you know, and the next day, maybe a mariachi band just to set the mood, and maybe other days, just flat out rock and roll, you know. We used to play those sentimental jailhouse songs like, ooh, when will I see you again, you know, and press our little faces up against the big bay window of the girls' unit, looking out at them, looking back at us. living in that sweet spot of longing, right? <laughs> oh, the yearning. Oh, isn't it always wishing, if only, as soon as I... It's that thing we just outside of our reach. <sighs> as soon as I get that, I'm going to be okay. Now, it's never in the getting, not in the actual getting. As soon as you do, you got to get another one, because that one was not quite right. <laughs> it's that anticipation that's always there. I didn't know what I came looking for, I came looking with. I didn't know that what I was looking for was already inside me. So I was looking out there for what I thought was going to fix me, and the trouble with doing that is that I was always about half a bubble off what it was I thought I was looking at anyway. I'd mistake arrogance for confidence, I'd mistake sex for love, I'd mistake brute strength for strength of character, get it up in my hot little hands, and it would just dissolve where I stood because it wasn't it. I had to come to AA to learn that it's when I'm thinking of you, constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. When I'm thinking of you, I'm not thinking of me. I didn't know that. Didn't know that was a, just the small basic secret. <sighs> One afternoon, I was sitting outside on the smoke break bench watching my boyfriend Terry being cuffed and escorted off by security. It's the last time I was ever going to see him. He's the one who threw the chair through the window and he's gone off to YA. You know, it was a hard, tragic day. You know, I was smoking tragic cigarettes and channeling Greta Garbo and... <sighs> 
you know, just broken hearted, really, because, um, I mean, this was a real relationship, you know, two, three weeks or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, I love that Bill writes that we avoid the deliberate manufacture of misery. We avoid that. Did you know that? I didn't know that before I got here. I thought that you just swim in it, you know, just light up and swim in it. So I'm hanging out and I'm watching all this go on and just inside the girls' unit I could hear Diana Ross singing at top decibel, touch me in the morning then just to walk away. It took me a long time to realize I was broken hearted and blue before I ever had a real date. Because <laughs> it's the way I saw my life, always looking, always looking in the wrong place. And I was supposed to be in that hospital, like I said, for two weeks. I ended up being there for a year. I went from the girls' unit to the co-ed unit to the unit where they put the patients they just don't know what to do with anymore. And somewhere along the line, I had begun to surrender to the thought that maybe I'm just a little nut house life or that every now and then I'm going to get out, but I am always, always going to end up back inside. Why? Because every time I do get out, I am right back doing the very thing that got me locked up in the first place because I've got no sufficient substitute. I'm still going, even with the trouble that it causes, it is still the thing. It is still the thing that works the best. By the time I got to that last unit, I had casts on both my arms. I was, because I'd been cutting, because that was just a different way of emotional release. And, and uh, I was no longer bathing or getting dressed because you don't have to do that to date in the nut house. And... Um, <laughs> I had just, just kind of given up, you know, and uh, my boyfriend that I met on that unit um, had just been released, and so a couple weeks later, I climbed up over the chimney and over the roof and met him on the other side. He was waiting in the car, and that was the last time I ever had to see that place, and I still sometimes get amused when I look back, and I think, what kind of a boyfriend did I have that, like, got released from the nut house and then came back to get his girlfriend? She'll be coming over the chimney any minute now. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent most of my adolescent life in one lockup or another and sitting in front of a judge in juvenile hall over and over waiting for placement, waiting for placement, just waiting for placement. You know, I come from, a, and my dad used to say that, he said, they're, I think they're just trying to buy you some time, Carla, and maybe they were right. You know, maybe they kept me alive long enough to uh, have a, some kind of a foundation before I could get to you. Because I had a lot of years of drinking after I left those, those places, too. But I come from a family where my, my sister committed suicide at the age of 17, my baby brother died of drug addiction and alcoholism when he was 30, and my last remaining sibling continues to drink, and, and uh, she lives back east and, um, and just can't seem to spring it. So I don't know the emotional stability of our family. As much as we, we did love each other, but we just, we didn't know how to function, didn't know how. And uh, uh, anyway, um, at the end of that, I, I, my, the last place I was in was a girl's home. And, um, and here's where I guess I should tell you that I've always believed that there was a power greater than ourselves, some, some great power that ran in and around and through us. You know, I've always felt that as a small child laying in my room, I knew, I could feel there was something. You know, but I, and I, I could never explain it. I couldn't stay connected. Couldn't, something would happen in our family that scared me or something, and I would pull the shade down between me and the sunlight of the spirit. Didn't even know I was doing it. Just me, I'm on my own, self-propelling, you know, making my own decisions now. I'll take care of that, thank you. And, uh, but I never stopped trying, you know. Once I, once I discovered the effect that alcohol produced in me, it did a lot for me. You know, I, I let it. It was my spirituality. It was my maturity. It was all of those things. It was a thing that connected me to you. It was a thing that, that protected me from you. It was all of those things. But I never stopped looking to see if I couldn't, you know, that connection to that power greater than myself was still very important. So I, I tried a lot of things. I, I tried being a Catholic for a couple of weeks in the fourth grade, you know, and uh, I was very attracted to the ritual. And uh, then I burned black candles for a couple of years, praying to the other guy for a while, you know, just um, trying to hedge my bets, really. I, I just, <laughs> just want to be on the side that's winning, you know. Then the television series Kung Fu came out. Some of you guys might remember that show. David Carradine played this, was a star, and he played a Buddhist priest named Cain. And that guy was tough. You know, he walked the Wild West in bare feet. You know, walking from town to town with that little bag of something on his belt. I don't know what was in that bag, but he looked pretty peaceful. And uh, 
He'd walk from town to town, and sometimes he'd be met, because he looked different than their, all the rest of the people, he'd be met by, with great hostility with, by a whole group of guys, and they'd meet him and, and assault him verbally. And he would just stand there ever so cool, you know, and just pearls of wisdom just rolled off his tongue. Not a lot of words, just boom. And they'd hear him, and they'd, you'd see their faces change, and they'd go off to help people. <laughs> You know, you can't help but see the power in that. And then he'd walk to another town, and this time they'd meet him again with great hostility, but they'd assault him physically. And when they did that, he kicked their ass. And I wanted what he had. You know, he seemed to be strength and serenity personified, right? It was something, it was an example, it was a living example of something, you know, my... Uh, uh, so I've got this going on. I get to this girl's home. That's a long way around to tell you. I get to this girl's home with this idea in my head. Plus, that combined with the music of the 60s, the idea of what I thought the 60s might have been had I been out there in them. I was 12 in 69, so they were over, you know. But but I, I watched TV, and I had I dreamt, you know, of that. I mean, they had they had power, too, right? We're talking about power. You know, they, they didn't take crap back then. They stood up. They marched. They gathered together, and they marched, and there was power in that. And they had that music. They had music that said things, that said things that people didn't like, but they were true. You know, that music, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and Traffic, and Blind Faith, and there was power in that. And uh, so by the time I get to this girl's home, uh, this is my combina this is my spirituality. You know, that and a big old glass of tequila, you know. <laughs> but uh, we're talking to our friends one day about this, and... And all of our friends said, man, San Francisco has gone to seed. That was, you know, all my, my trips to San Francisco were based on that, flower power and all of that stuff. And they said, they're all in Oregon now. And we said, whoa, there are people in, and there are people, and they are in Oregon. So we went out the second story window, this girl's home, down the tree, and into Randy's truck, and off to Oregon, where God might be. And we ended up in the Springfield Eugene area, which was just perfect for us. And my friends rented a house and let me come with them. And I don't know about you, but I never went anywhere new thinking, let's go screw this up too. You know, I always went somewhere thinking, we're going to start fresh, fresh start, clean slate. Going to start all over. Get it, get it right this time. You know, just hold on. Going to, going to do it. And we got up there, going to get back to the land. We planted a garden in the front yard of this house. That's when I learned that in Oregon, when they talked about hoeing, they meant with a tool. It was a different thing. And two things happened while I was up there that I certainly couldn't see while it was going on. But looking back, I could see that. And alcoholism already had me in its grips. And one was we couldn't always drink the way I needed a drink. And when we've got no booze and I've got no steps of fellowship, God of my understanding, no sufficient substitute, I am my reliance on alcohol already so developed that when you take it away, I'm restless, irritable, and discontent. My life quickly becomes your fault. And when I could drink the way that I needed to drink, I was always overshooting the mark, again and still at 17. And my friends had to ask me to leave, and I was asked to leave a lot. And I ended up back in my father's house against his better judgment. That lasted just a few months just a few months before he'd had enough, you know, had enough of that, both of us getting up at the same time every morning, and he'd leave for work, and I'd go sit in his den, and I'd drink from his liquor cabinet. And then he'd come back home in the afternoon and see me sitting in the very spot where he'd left me that morning. And I'd see that broken-hearted look in his eyes, and I'd have nothing to say for myself, no, no solution, nothing, nothing, not even, just not even able to say it's going to be different. Right before my 18th birthday, he came to me and he said what I know were the hardest words he ever had to say to his oldest daughter, and that's, I'm not going to watch you die and I'm not going to help you do it. you got to go. And on my way out the door, all I could remember is that one of the counselors at the rehab had told me I was a great actress. And I know today I must have misunderstood because I ended up on Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, there's not a lot of auditioning going on out there, just in, so you know. And I was 18 years old, starting my days off with a pint of pop pop vodka, and I would go wherever the day took me. And some days it was a party, and some days it was just surviving. Not a lot of hope about it getting any different, but it was the way it was. A few months into that, I met a man walking down Hollywood Boulevard, and I saw the light in his eyes, and I didn't realize it was orange sunshine, but we hit it off, and I moved in with him that night, and I didn't even know his last name. And six weeks later, he's asking me to leave, and I still don't know his last name. But I like to bring him up because years later he was on my eight-step list. He was on that first inventory that I did. And 
you know, he was just someone, one of those that just came to mind. I knew what I had done. I knew what I needed to do to make it right, and I was really willing. It, you know, sometimes you just get those. You barely get done writing when you know, boom, I'm ready for that one. And um, so I made my the first round of amends to my family, which, you know, those took a while, and, and some of the others. And then later, about the last part of my first year of sobriety, I went to look for him. And I went everywhere I knew to look, but of course I, I didn't find him. And my sponsor finally said, you know, you're chasing your tail right now. You've got to leave that alone. If you're supposed to find that guy, you'll find him. But in God's time, not yours. You know, in the meantime, if you really want to change your life, go ahead and, and start taking actions in that direction. Like, try being a friend to a man in a vertical fashion. Why don't you start there? <laughs> you know, it's not in the big book, but it's a good idea, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I love that, those simple things that I could keep in mind. And to tell you the truth... When I got here, it wasn't like I needed a lot of convincing, but I didn't know how. I knew long ago that I didn't have self-respect. I saw it on you, and I also knew that I didn't have the least idea as to how to get it, or this maybe not even the power to do the things that I needed to do to have that. You know, So I needed you. I needed a sponsor. I needed to submit to somebody, give them spiritual consent to talk to me and tell me what they saw. You know, it's not about becoming the boss of you. My sponsor used her intuition to teach me how to use mine. And the beauty of this program is, really, for me, I say this a lot these days, but as we're really glommed on to it, is that if you do these things, you're, you're, you know, you're going to have an experience, your own experience, you know, and we all get one. It's not like I took these steps and then now I can call somebody to find out they had a cousin one day somewhere who knew a friend who had a brother who had a spiritual experience. I did the work and I got a spiritual experience. You know, and that's for each of us. We get it if we do this. That's the beauty of it to me. Um, Anyway, right before my 13th AA birthday, I had to go give a talk on the other side of town. It was a hot Sunday afternoon, and I did not feel like going. And thank God you guys have taught me, you know, walk right through those feelings and go do it. doesn't matter how you feel. It matters what you do. Go if you said you're going to be there, go be there. You know, and I'm one for, you know, before AA, I didn't know how to show up. Didn't even want to. Didn't think I could blow off a dinner for two and not think I'd be missed. You know what I mean? Just... <laughs> And uh, I just, but you, you told me show up no matter what. Show up. Show up. You know, when everything is always different than I think it's going to be, just walking through that little bit of fear. So I go and I give that talk, and of course I felt better. And when the meeting was over, the thank you line came through, and, and about the middle of it, this man stopped and he said, hey, where were you in 1976? And it was a guy from Hollywood Boulevard standing in front of me with eight and a half years of sobriety, and I was almost 13. You know, so only a very well-organized, loving God could have made that happen when I, and all my efforts to get it done, just couldn't get it done in my own steam. And I love that story for me, and we all get one. You know, we all have our own versions of these things, but it just reminds me, I can go back to that and remember that everything is in perfect time, even when I don't think so. Everything is always in perfect time. And, um, and so it calms me down. And anyway... That was a long time to come, and I left Hollywood, and I hooked up with another guy from another rehab, and, you know, that's where they keep the boyfriends and partners and whatever it is you might be looking for, so. And, uh, again, flying on the coattails of the 60s, loving the idea of peace and love and all that stuff. We just couldn't stop knocking the hell out of each other really long enough to implement the principles fully of peace and love, and so we beat each other up and down the California coast, and I'm the kind of a drunk who sleeps by the side of the road and calls it camping. You know what I mean? It's just like I'm delusional. I think I'm on a spiritual quest, and I'm a hobo, you know. <laughs> and we pitched a tent in the mountains in southern Oregon and lived there till the rains came, and then we moved it across town and onto another mountain. We'd been invited by our new spiritual advisor who lived up the hill in the plastic tent, and... Uh, he invited us to come live on his mining claim. And uh, he had this beat-up old cabin there with uh, no roof. We threw a plastic tarp, tarp over the top, called it a skylight, and then the baby came. And even when I had, this is how delusional I am, even when that baby came, I was excited for it. I thought, here's where I'm going to break the cycle. Now, here's where all that therapy kicked in from the mental hospitals, you know, and all that rehab, you know, in younger days. <laughs> now I'm going to break the cycle. You know, because we're, now we're drinking like moonshine and homemade wine because it's organic and much better for you. <laughs> you 
And alcoholism does not care who you love. Alcoholism does not care. And she was supposed to be top priority, and of course, I take a drink, and she slips way down. Slips way down. And she got in the way of one of our fights when she was about 10 months old, and so I had to take her up the road where it's got to be better somewhere else. Got to be better. And so I moved up to, we, I took her up to Idaho with me, and that be, my first legitimate work was in the bars up there. You know, not working in bad places, great places to work. Never occurred to me not to drink on the job. Why else would you have those jobs? It just seemed to me so efficient. <laughs> but I still couldn't bring home enough money to pay rent for more than a week at a time, so we lived by the we lived in those rent by the week motels. And my kid became one of those kids that you see in her t-shirt and underwear and yesterday's lunch down the front of it because her mom's not paying attention. And after a while, of course, that state's not working for us anymore either. We're back down in L.A. I'm renting a room for my aunt on one end of town, and I've got a job tending bar on the other. My daughter was almost four years old by then, and again, not a bad place to work. Everybody else was doing just fine, working at that bar, doing exactly what I was doing. Every afternoon, I'd kiss my girl goodbye, and I'd take off for the bar across town, and I'd stop at the halfway point, because you get a little thirsty going 30, 40 miles every day, you know. So I'd stop at the halfway point in the first cabin in, in a, a little town called Arcadia, and I'd have my primer drink, so shots of Corvo Gold and Bud Backs that got me ready to go do my shift in uh, uh at where I worked, and um, every afternoon, to have a few shots of gold, a couple of bud backs, get up off the bar stool, and go finish my shift, and crawl back home in the wee hours of the morning, and start all over again. And one afternoon, I kissed my girl goodbye, and I took off for that same place where I worked, and stopped at the same first cabin, ordered up those same drinks, shots of gold, and bud back. And to this day, I don't know what was different on that day from the day before except for 24 hours because I didn't hate that job I was going to and I didn't love my daughter any less on that day than I love her today. But I sat on that bar stool and I drank those drinks and I could not stop. I couldn't stop long enough to get up and go see about that job and I couldn't stop long enough to go see about that kid. So I sat on the bar stool and I drank them both away. They were gone in one fell swoop, the kid and the job. And I stayed and I lived off the kindness of strangers there in that little area for a, about a month. I had to stop calling my daughter to find out how she was doing because she kept asking me those hard questions like, Mommy, when are you coming to get me? And I had no answer for that because deep in my heart of hearts, I knew that she was better off where she was and I had no intention, not even a hope or a whisper of a hope of ever stopping drinking. It was just not going to be. It had to be something else. It couldn't be the booze. And I had a few more years of drinking to go. I, I fell into another job in another dive bar and I met the man I would marry thinking maybe if I made, got married and made my life look like yours did, maybe that would do it. He and I got married about the time we should have split up and we moved into a, an apartment together. We became the neighborhood entertainment. We settled our arguments with a shotgun. Whoever gets to the gun first wins. <laughs> My first exposure to AA was after one of our fights. We were at the bar where we drank, and we were fighting over whether or not I should get off the bar stool. And I lost that fight, and I ended up with some black eyes and broken ribs again. Not a lot of people feeling sorry for me, just glad I was leaving. He had to pick me up, take me to the hospital, and get me fixed up, and then brought me home. And I can't tell you the amount of times I put that man in the position of having to save my life and try to kill me all at the same time. And he had to leave for work that weekend, and before he left, he set me up with a giant ice chest full of beer and a bottle of beef eater gin chilling on top, and now I'm drinking gin because tequila had been making me so mean. You understand that. And <laughs> so I'm drinking the gin, and I'm dialing the phone, and I wasn't always a drunk dialer, but I guess I was that night, and I know we probably have a few of those in here. So I'm drinking the gin, dialing the phone, and I don't know all of who I called, but I know I felt like a battered woman, so I called a battered woman shelter. And I asked the woman who answered the phone to fix my life. And she asked me if I'd ever been to an AA meeting. And I don't know how she made that leap, but she did. And <laughs> So what I heard her say was that she'd fix my life. She'd help me out if I went to an AA meeting. And so I found a wonderful AA meeting, perfectly wonderful AA meeting not far from where I lived. Perfectly wonderful meeting. It was there then. It's still there. And I went there with everything but readiness everything and that's something you cannot give me you cannot make me ready i can uh, the only way i can make me ready is by taking the walk just got to just so i went in there feeling very sorry for myself and there was a woman speaker that night the only thing i heard her say was that somewhere during her drinking career she switched to beer so i did thought well since beer is not really drinking anyway 
and the representative from Alcoholics Anonymous did say, switch to beer. <laughs> beer's not really, you know, I, I think beer's more like a breakfast food, you know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it's got all that weed and hops and barley, right? I mean, you just throw it in your oatmeal and go to town, you, you know what I mean? It's actually kind of a whole grain breakfast food, and I don't think we should do without it. And drinking beer gave me the illusion I was controlling it a little bit. You know, I'd get a little further into my day before I'd get really, really gone. And um, so that, that lasted another couple of years. And um, I got the kid back, for better or worse, when she was about eight and a half. And, you know, fast forward up to she's almost ten, and, and uh, we have... We're living in a little tiny place over across town in Pasadena. My husband, my daughter, and me, and we're just falling apart. We're just scraping by. You know, I'm no longer welcome in the bars where I was drinking. My life was getting very, very small. We had one more of those Saturday afternoon fights where the cops are in the driveway one more time and the neighbors are watching one more time. The kid's standing over in there in the corner and her mismatched clothes and her unkempt hair, and she got that look of fear in her eyes one more time. And I can't tell her it's going to be any different. I don't know how we got there that afternoon. I didn't wake up thinking, let's do this. I woke up thinking, if everybody will just be cool, we'll all be okay. So the cops left. They took the gun. The husband left for the last time. It's me and the kid and the booze, and I still can't stop drinking. Now, here's where a hard drinker might take a look at their life and say, wow, really sick of this, really tired of things going like this. And they might even have to go to a detox for a week or two. They'd come home, they'd have a story to tell, they'd go right back to work, and they'd get on the trolley and keep moving. That's a hard drinker. You know, and our book talks about that. Somebody having a sufficient excuse to go ahead and move on, and they can. But for me as an alcoholic, what that caused me to do was to pull the 12-pack closer to the couch so I didn't have to keep getting up and down to go get another drink. My first sponsor told me if I wanted to affect a conscious contact with a power greater than myself, I could start by counting the coincidences that happened in my life. Just simple coincidences. You know, those things that seem to fall together without me having their hands on them. And, you know, those things are going on all the time, and it's just the things that I think I want or that are my idea that I kind of cotton to faster than I do the other things, you know. But, but that was a simple exercise for me. And the first one I could count was that I had moved in next door to a woman who had five years of sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. Didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. Not for the longest and she had knocked, she knocked, came over a couple days after all that, that happened, and she brought me a big book and a 12 and 12, and I invited her in, and she sat on the couch, and she told me her story. She just talked to me about her and her drinking, and in her story, I heard me. And I had seen her walking around over the last year, and, and I had seen that, you know, she hadn't been drinking, and what impressed me more about that was it didn't seem to bother her that she wasn't drinking. And that got my attention. You know, because when I've got no booze and I've got no steps or fellowship or God of my understanding, I am restless, irritable, and discontent. Very, very, very hard to get along with. You know, I just, uh, I feel like you've stripped the coating off my wires. You know, I feel oversensitive and underloved, and I don't know what you meant by that or why you looked at me that way. And my head closes in on me from there. You know, it just gets so loud, so much so that on my own steam, even though I know what I know by that time, about alcohol. I know that the window of relief has gotten really, really small. I know that I no longer have to invite trouble. It seems to come unsolicited. And even though I know I can't guarantee if I'm going to have two or 22, I'm going to have come to some point when it's under my own steam that I am going to have to pick up that drink. It's going to be the only choice I have. So I don't know how her 12 little thinly veiled Sunday school sentences are going to have any effect on me in the face of what I've become, you know. I just didn't know. It just seemed kind of weak. You know, kind of a little bit, a little bit Sunday school, a little bit romper room, you know. I just, you know. Father Tom Weston, I've heard him say many times, you know, you've got to be pretty sick and tired to find us interesting. <laughs> and that's the thing about getting beat up by our lifestyle drinking is that we become more and more interested, hopefully, So I didn't get sober that day, but about a week and a half later, I, one Friday, I just didn't go back and buy any more booze. And exactly what I thought was going to happen, happened. I got sick, and I shook into the weekend, and I shook into Monday and into Tuesday. And, 
And uh, by Tuesday afternoon, I was stark raving sober again, you know, one more time at that point. Instead of going back to the store, I went back to my neighbor. I went over to my neighbor, and I asked her what to do. And she sent me up to a meeting in Sierra Madre, California. And she said, go up there, and not that there will be any big question, but raise your hand and tell them that you're new. <laughs> and um, I sat way back by the open door and the exit sign, just in case. And the hope I heard that night came in the form of small talk, and I don't know why it was. It was just a feeling. People seemed to care about each other. They were asking each other questions like, hey, how you doing? Did you get a sponsor yet? How's that fourth step coming? You know, uh, do you need a ride home? Would you like a cup of coffee? How's your lawn, Joe? Your lawn? You know, and it occurred to me, my God, could my life ever be so elegant and simple as to be concerned about a lawn? You know, where it just, you go back to the, it seemed like it had been so far removed. The way I was living was so far removed from those simple, beautiful things like fresh cut grass. You know, I'd been foraging and scraping and self-loathing and just trying to get by. trying desperately not to go back to where I was. Because had, life had improved. I was now living indoors on a pretty regular basis. I had the kid back. I had all the elements of a life getting ready to go forward. And it was slipping through my fingers. And at the end of that meeting, the secretary came back to me and she asked me if I'd read that portion of Chapter 11, A Vision for You, that we read at the end of a lot of meetings in Southern California. And this time I took it from her, I said yes. And as I read, I came into the room just a little bit, just like I do every time I say yes to something you ask me to do. And it seemed like a flimsy read, but I did it. And everything, every little small thing now after 28 years has been woven into a huge foundation for me. AA is not the only thing I do, but it is the very first thing I do, and it is always a foundation. Everything, 12 steps, 12 traditions, 12 concepts, my whole entire life, my whole being has sprung from that. Alcoholics Anonymous was the window through which I came to find that connection and, and maintain that connection with that power. And if you're new, you might think, oh, my God, how big can your life possibly be to be based solely on a foundation of 12 steps, 12 traditions, 12 concepts? Oh, my God. But I got to tell you, when I was out there running out, running around with no rules and anything goes, and if it feels good, do it, and all that stuff, my life just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And I come in here and I take that certain simple attitude and I, it takes some actions that are on my own behalf. And my life just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it works. So I got a sponsor right away. And uh, at 89 days, I had to go out one more time. Had to have that drink one more time. Like that first step edge was coming back. Like, uh, I don't know, a Bible, I mean, a beer and a big book sounded a lot more like balance. <laughs> And as soon as I took that drink, I knew I wanted what I had had just a few minutes before, even with the discomfort. And I got the idea, I got it, you know, that if I could get comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable, I was going to make this thing. I could, if I could get back. And I had to spend the next, I had to finish that drunk. 24 hours later, my sponsor came to pick me up. And you know, I want you to hear this. If you're new, again, you know, if you go out and drink, it's never a matter of, are you welcome? You are always welcome in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Always welcome. That is not the question. The question is, can you? Can you come back over the threshold of these doors and get any kind of traction at all that keeps you in this seat and on this side of the bottle? Can you? Because we see a lot of people, we don't use, we don't say this is a fatal illness just to be dramatic. We say it because we see it over and over and over and over again. I have a good friend who just lost 12 years a year ago, and she can't get a day. She can't get a day. But I was fortunate. The next night, 20, 24 hours later, my sponsor came to pick me up. She helped me throw away the bottles, and she took me up to the big book study that night, and I haven't had a drink since. And I'm so glad when I was sitting in that meeting, and I was not in great shape, and I smelled like booze, that nobody said... Uh, Ew, I smell alcohol in an AA meeting, you know. (laughs) 
And some guy came up to me and he said, hey, you want to come up on Tuesday and make coffee with me? And I thought, dang, somebody thinks I'm going to be here on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and I showed up on the days in between, and it was working for me so well to be, just to be here. I wanted to immerse myself in this, whatever this was, and I couldn't quite get my hands around it, but or my head around it, nothing, I didn't, you know, I mean, you just take take it apart piece by piece, and how's that going to work? But just being near you, being in here and listening, I, I was staying sober from midnight to midnight, and it was working. And uh, I took the steps, and I started to make, made that first round of amends to my family, which was really important. And we were, you know, I was afraid to even talk about that to them for a while. You know, I didn't want to give any of us any false hope. You know, and and uh, and I'm also. I want you to know this: that I was one of those people who, for nine months, I did not feel like being here. I did not want. You know, I just. I the obsession was on me all the time. I'd come into these meetings and I'd hear about people saying, "Oh, the obsession was lifted," you know, and I'd think, "Oh, good for you." Um, <laughs> And it wasn't that I wasn't surrendered to my illness, but I just wasn't sure if this thing was going to work. I was doing it anyway, and it's just I'm living proof that it doesn't matter what you believe. If you do it, you get it. And so after nine months, in, uh, about in the middle of my, making my amends to my family, I realized it had been a few days since I'd been obsessed. You know, that horrible obsession. You know what obsession sounds like. That just like, sounds like that kid following his mother around in the grocery store wanting cookies. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> mom, 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 mom. I want a drink, I want a drink, let's have a drink, let's have a drink on the way to the meeting, on the way, let's have a drink at the break, have a drink on the way home, just a little drink, just a little drink, it won't matter, a little drink, little drink, little drink. And all of a sudden that was gone. It was gone, and I haven't had that since. Um, other women started asking me to sponsor them, and i got to tell you, the only fifth step I like better than mine is yours. And I'll tell you why. Because in your eyes, I see forgivability. I see lovability, redeemability. I see hope and growth where I don't always see it in myself. I'm a big believer you got to give it away to get it. That's where the circle is complete. Right there, right there. I learn as much, at least as much, taking somebody else through these steps that I ever did going through them myself. I see me and you. After a couple of years, I'd had you guys, and my daughter didn't have anybody, really, and she was 11 years old, coming home at all hours of the night if she came home at all, beat up and bloody. She'd been jumped into a gang and starting to find her sense of family and camaraderie out in the street where I used to, so it was time to get her some big help. I was concerned. You know, she, we got 18-year-old Vatos crawling in and out of her bedroom window, and she's 11. And um, I was concerned, and so I found it ended up finding a treatment center for her, and she was in there six months. And it was for me to offer her that. It was for me to offer her everything that I possibly could, whether she ever wanted it from me or not. Whether she ever wanted to have a relationship from me, it was for me to get her on the best foundation I could. And then she could make her decision later on. You know, and it's really kind of not fair. We stand up here for an hour or so, and we give this talk, and, and we squeeze all these years of, of before, during, and after, you know, and, and then the newcomer walks out going, you know, like some bad episode of Law and Order, you know what I mean? And then the, then the newcomer walks out going, wow, it only took an hour, you know. <laughs> you know, it took a long time. I learned that mountains are moved a spoonful at a time. And uh, every day I get up and give them my best spoonful, and I'd show up when they asked me to and stay away when they asked me to. And my daughter wrote me letters about how she hated me and then the other letters how why she loved me, you know, and just... Uh, When she got out, she wanted to go live with her dad for a while. And I had to get out of the way, and I had to shut up about what I thought of him, you know, and uh, and just get out of the way and let her make her decision, be an example, be the best me I could be, and let her figure it out. And uh, a couple years later, she came home and, and to live with me, and, and uh, she and her boyfriend sat in front of me, and they had a funny look on their faces, and I told them they were pregnant, and they nodded, and... And uh, it was scary for them. She was 15 when she found out. And um, and I got to tell her, I'm going to be there. No matter what you decide, I'm there for you. Whatever you decide, you do. You you know, and then I was. I was present at the birth of my first grandson. And, 
And I got to walk through all that stuff with her. And, and it wasn't over by then. She, you know, she, up until her early 20s, she was struggling, you know, trying to figure it out. And, and now that kid's 38 years old and she just turned 38 last week. And, and just, uh, just a little over, I, it's now it's been almost two years, I guess, that uh, I sat with my, my new husband and uh, my father and my mended family and grandkids and everybody and watched her collect her master's degree. And, and, um, and then just a few months ago when that horrible thing happened in San Bernardino, she was on the crisis impact team that went in afterwards and helped the families try to put together the pieces of their lives. You know, so she's her, and whether or not she is, she's, she, I don't know if she's because, who she is because or in spite of me or any combination thereof, but I know that with her, with the women I sponsor and with the people that allow me in their lives, I get to be a privileged witness. And you reflect back to me the possibilities for me and the growth Um, and so that took time and that's what the fellowship is for you know we got the steps that's the program the fellowship is the um, is the people you know when we we all come from different places that's where the circumstance is all really interesting right I lived in a nut house you lived in a tree house you know it's uh, <laughs> You know, and, and uh, somebody's sick, so that person over there used to, was sick at one time too, and those two get together and we talk and, and we, and, you know, and, and I don't believe ever, ever, I don't have the kind of a God that shoots things at me to see how I'm going to do with them, you know. I don't believe in that. But, uh, but I do believe in uh, the love of God after, in the aftermath who, sa who sticks out his hand or her hand and says, hey, I'm, we're going to walk through this too. You know, that's the kind of God I have. When I was five years sober, I was raped by an intruder in my home, in my own apartment. Um, I was not out, not that I deserve it anymore being out there, but it's a lot more likely to happen, standing out on the street, getting into strange cars with strange men, doing strange things. But, uh, uh, but now I'm five years sober, and I've come home from the gym, and I'm sleeping in my bed, and I woke up in the middle of the night, rolled over, and I rolled right into a hand and a knife, and he said, don't say a word or I'll cut your head off. And he took the telephone cord and he ta tied my hands behind my back and he raped me and he robbed me that night in my room. And I want to tell you that at five years of sobriety, I had a much bigger God than I got here with. Um, you know, the second step asked me to choose to believe that God's everything or nothing. It doesn't say anything about me having to define him or understand him or any of that. I just have to believe somehow. And uh, if God is everything, then there's nothing, there's nowhere in the world I am that he's not, He's if he's everything. So even though I had that fight or flight, I mean, of course, I mean, that was kind of God-given too, I had some peace and I just got to pay attention. And after a few hours, um, I kind of got loose and then we had a little wrestling match in the living room. And instead of getting angry, he got a little shook up and he even left the knife in the kitchen and he went out the same window he came in. And it turned out that I knew this guy. I'd actually watched him get sober 30 days before I did. I watched him get his life, his wife, his kids and everything back. And then I watched him join the church, leave AA behind. And when he went out, he went out like that. And what I chose to learn from that is that while the big book tells us to be quick to see where religious people are right, to make use of what they offer, this is the place where I learned the terms and conditions of my alcoholism. This is where I learned that I'm not one of those people who can go home after a Sunday sermon and have a glass of wine. I remember that here. I stand at the door of Alcoholics Anonymous 28 years later to see the newcomer and active alcoholism on them, to see what happens then. It's been a long time since my last drink, and I hope maybe n never till my next drink. But I have to remember that that's a factor. That's the stake. Those are the stakes for me as an alcoholic. In church, we, I, we, we celebrate spirituality in general. You know, it's in general. But in AA, we point it right at alcoholism. That's why I believe it's so important for the singleness of purpose. You know, we kind of get away from there. And, and I'm not, I wasn't in here because I ate too much chocolate, and I still don't have that problem. You know, I got sober, and I don't, you don't find me locked up in my room eating, you know, mountains of Hershey bars or, you know, and, and sometimes that does happen. 
but but it doesn't have to. If I want to be in these rooms and I want and I want my my primary purpose, my primary condition treated, I'm an AA. And the solution works because there are all these other fellowships that use the solution. But that first half of that first step of identification is so important. I'm so glad that when I came in and I sat down and I had a problem with drinking, I didn't know how it was a problem. I, didn't under, I couldn't have told you, I have an allergy of the body, an obsession of the mind. But when I came into an AA meeting and I heard them talking about the way their relationship with alcohol, I thought, I got that. Um, so they caught him a couple weeks later, and there was a trial that followed, and as part of the defense, they had a lot of the guys I'd known years before get up and testify as to who I used to be, including my ex-husband, and that's the mark I left on him, was that he was more inclined to testify on behalf of the rapist than he was for me, and he's not been interested in any of my amends, and that has to be okay for, you know, till he changes his mind, if ever. And, and um, so we had to get a character witness for me, and again, when I got here to AA, you know, you couldn't use the word Carla and good character in the same sentence. You just couldn't. But five years later, by that time, I was working at a big investment firm downtown Los Angeles, a place I never would have walked in the front doors of years before. You know, it was a big, fancy place. People like Henry Kissinger walked the halls of this place because he was on the board. You know, and I'm walking undetected. Why? Because cause I went in and I did what they asked me to do. That was it. Went in and just kept doing it. And, uh, and, and, and kind of delighted, you know, really delighted that I was able to fit into the world and function in a way, you know. And so the department head of this place uh, volunteered to come and testify on my behalf, and they told him all about who I used to be. And he said, yeah, but she shows up early and she stays late, and she was where she said she was, and see, that's Alcoholics Anonymous speaking for itself. He didn't have to be coached. She just got up and told the truth as he'd experienced it through me. And then it was my turn to testify. And see, by that time, I'd gotten a, a, a woman sponsor. My first sponsor left AA, and, and uh, so I was, you know, they were still weren't lining up to sponsor me. So I asked this man, Lee, to be my sponsor. And he was just a good old boy. He was very direct, very serious. You know, he'd, he'd say things like, well, that's going to feel a whole lot better as soon as it quits hurting. You know, just <laughs> simple... And he came over after all this happened, and he put double locks on my apartment windows and, and uh, helped me collect evidence that the police had missed and all of that stuff. But we realized I needed to ask a woman, and we, she, he walked me right up to Marguerite. Why? Because he knows that sponsorship is not ownership. Sponsorship is just we help each other get to the next place. Some of us have the same sponsor all our time, and some of us don't. And, um, that, you know, there's no right or wrong about that. As, I mean, and I'm not co-signing sponsor hopping. That's not what I'm saying. As soon as a sponsor says something you don't like, then you move on. But you know what I'm saying. Um, so Mar Mar the first thing Marguerite so told me was, you, you know, you're going to have to forgive this guy. And I know she's right. I know we're people who can't handle even seemingly justifiable resentments. You know, but the guy had scared me. And at five years of sobriety, anger was still my favorite way to respond to fear like that. I mean, I'd stand on the street and the car door would slam and I'd jump and I'd be pissed all over again. You know, and the guy owned me. He owned me and I know better than that. I had experienced better than that and still I can't shake it myself. So that seven-step prayer became my mantra. You know, change me. I don't know how to let go of this. It's like a suit that doesn't fit anymore. I can't be angry. I can't not be angry. And I'm at the turning point. So I'm doing this and then the trial comes and it's my turn to testify and I look, I sit in the witness stand, and I look out, and I see him sitting at the, def the defense table, and that's a place where I've sat before, and I could certainly sit again if I were to take a drink. And what came to my mind was that little prayer at the top of page 67 where it says, though we didn't like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us, he, like me, they, like ourselves, were perhaps spiritually sick. And it occurred to me that I could be sitting right in his spot. You know, and... and You know, here's where it really, I really, really got my heart around. Um, we don't forgive from a spiritual hilltop. We don't forgive because, you know, I, I hate that when I hear people say, oh, and I've prayed for you. Isn't that nice? You know? <laughs> I don't forgive because, because I'm better than you. I forgive because I'm just like you. 
You know, and, I, and over 28 years, what I've had to realize oof, is that it, it, it slows me down, and I don't like that. But I have been just about, or could be, and just about everybody I've ever resented. <laughs> and that'll slow you down if you think about it. You know, I, and so it changed me. It, it, just like a little crack of light under the doorway. I think the forgiveness came, but the healing took another 18 months or so, the nightmares and all of those things. Now, this guy was sentenced to 20 years, and he did 17. He's not been able to stay out of prison, as far as I know. But um, I know it works in prison because I've gone to visit those guys. I've taken panels in there and gone to visit, and I know that be the people who avail themselves of these steps, they get better, and they, they, they make those amends. A lot of good stuff happens in prison. They walk spiritually free. Some of those guys are never getting out and they walk spiritually free inside. The detective who worked the case came to me and he said, I don't know who you were back then, I'm not even sure I want to know, but whatever it is you're doing now, keep doing it, because it seems to be working. And that's Alcoholics Anonymous speaking for itself. And, you know, I have made a lot of mistakes in my sobriety. It's not always, not always neat, and, and uh, we, you know, we try to go through things with grace and dignity, but sometimes I have to say, screw grace and dignity, let's just get through it. And, you know, and we'll shake it off and try to, try to do better, you know, but, uh, uh, but I'm still here. Everything I do in those 11 and a half, the, the, the remaining 11 and a half steps after I make that first half of the first step admission is about, it protects that first half of the first step. It's always, in step 10, we reiterate, you know, alcohol is a subtle foe. I'll have, let's have a drink at 28 years of sobriety may not sound like let's have a drink anymore. It sounds like mm, I can cheat on my taxes a little bit. You know, I don't need to sponsor that one. I don't need to say yes to that. That's what, that's what let's have a drink starts out sounding like in the very beginning. And so everything I do, I have to remember that for me, the stakes are a drink. And again, not because I'm running around tr with the obsession, but just because I've got a sufficient substitute. I've got a good life. You gave me something else to do. Um, I, my father doesn't have to sit up nights anymore watching the news to make sure his daughter's name isn't on the list of the victims of the serial killers of the day. He sleeps well, and he knows why. You know, um, up until I was about 12 years sober, he had to tell me the story about how he'd stay up at night when... He knew I was out and about, and people like the Green River Killer and the Hillside Strangler and all those guys were out running around, and, and uh, the only way he could allow himself to sleep was by um, watching the news, and if he didn't hear my name called, he could allow himself to sleep. Now, he knew that it didn't make that much sense, that it was a little irrational, but it was what is the story he told himself. You know, when I was about 12 years sober, he uh, we were at lunch one day, and he started to tell me that again, and I thought, oh, my God, how long do I have to listen to this story? Because, you know, because now it's all about me again, and I'm thinking, I have sharp objects, you know. I, mm. He started to say, he, you know, I have no pictures of you when you were a teenager, and I said, uh, oh, yeah, and I'm thinking, yeah, what can I do about that? And, uh, and then he goes on to say, well, he says, uh, but to see you now, I wouldn't trade all the pictures in the world for who you are today. And so if I had stabbed him, I'd have missed that, you know. <laughs> About two years before I got sober, my baby sister committed suicide at the age of 17. It took her all weekend to die. And while she lay on life support down there in a West Covina hospital, uh, the family gathered around in the waiting room, and I'd leave that, and I'd go out to the van where the booze was, and I'd drink, and I'd go back in. And I'd talk to my mother. I just blamed her and talked to her in a way a daughter should never talk to her mother, especially when her baby lay dying in the next room. And I don't know how you make amends for that, except that I start, started by calling her once a week and trying to find out how I might add to her life instead of take. And it required some listening and just um, and persistence and consistency and just showing up. And over time, we became very, very close, so much so that it wasn't it just wasn't even a thing I had to do. It was a thing I got to do. And... And uh, when my baby brother died of this disease, uh, six foot ten, thirty years old, 160 pounds, when he lay on life support in a Spokane hospital, his heart literally disintegrating from the crank, and he wasn't going to stop drinking. Mercifully, when he died, I got to go up and be the kind of a daughter my mother needed while she buried a second child. And I don't know what kind of pain that is for a parent, but I know that this time, because of AA, I got to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. 
You know, and so all these years later, even in maybe in different configurations, but I still sponsor and I still go to meetings and I still stand at the door and wait for the newcomer because even if I never needed another meeting for the rest of my life, I hope I never forget that I owe, that I owe, and every day I stay, the debt gets bigger. The joy of living is our is uh, the theme of our twelfth step, and I'm going to end with this little story just because I love this story. I'm sorry, but it's a uh, I know we have dog people in the room, right? We have dog people, yeah, yeah. Well, I was re we get reminded, you know, every once in a while of just the things that we already knew, but just they come in different forms. And we had, uh, we tried to foster this little pit bull uh, lab uh, named Sammy. We named her Sammy, and she was just a little over a year old, and and uh, we had her with us for a couple for a little while. And every morning I'd get up and I'd put her food down for her. You know, it'd be time to feed her and. And uh, she'd be so excited. You know, everything is the dog's favorite. Everything is their favorite. Favorite, favorite. You know, and uh, so I put her food down in front of her. It was the same food she saw last night and the day before and the day before that. Same food, just new day, new attitude. She's literally, it's like, it's the first time she'd ever seen food, you know. And it's like, oh! <laughs> you know, and she's wagging her tail. Oh, we're going to eat. We're going to eat. I can't believe we're going to eat. <laughs> it's my favorite. Eating's my favorite. And then so she'd eat the food, and then she'd come running into the bedroom where Doug and I were, and she'd see us, the same faces she saw last night, the night before, and the day before that. You know, same faces, new day, new attitude, right? She's just like, oh, it's you. We're going to party. I can't believe it's you. And so she'd play with us for a little while, and then she'd go jetting out the doggy door out into the backyard, you know, same yard she was in last night, the day before, and the day before that, same yard, same squirrels. Different day, new attitude. She'd be running in circles with that goldfish mentality, you know, whoo, a castle, ooh, a castle, ooh, a castle. <laughs> and I'd look out the back door and I'd see her in this moment, right here in this moment where we feel a God, you know, where we feel that power, that right here, right now. There's no anxiety of, the, of a minute from now and no guilt from a minute ago, just like right here, right now. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm on awakening, my feet hit the floor and I say, thank you. And I do my prayer and meditation. I ask God for his list instead of giving him mine, right? Just a whole different little twist there. I get to feel that, you know? Not like stupid joy, like, <gasps> like I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you know, like... I mean, because stuff happens, you know, but we still get to walk through. We still walk. We, we go through. I don't run away anymore. But the joy of living, that great, you know, where I just know I'm exactly, everything is exactly right. And uh, when I don't do that, when my feet hit the floor and I blow right fat past the prayer and I go straight for the coffee pot and I'm talking to the people who aren't in the room, right? <laughs> Trying to the re recall the resentment I had just a minute ago. What was that? Before I know it, I am sitting on the computer looking for a fight on Facebook. <laughs> talking to people I don't know about things I care nothing about. But it all becomes very, very important right now, don't it? Just the difference, just a, the smallest different difference in my attitude can change my day, can change my whole life. If you're new, I hope you come in here and you try this on. Just try it on and don't be afraid to make a mistake. Our friend Vincio used to say you can't be afraid to look bad in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe it's the best place to be a mess if you're going to be. You know, that's what we're here for. So um, I want to thank you again for having me, and uh, keep coming back. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.